What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York. We are back at Le Poussin Rouge, and today we are here with Adam and Steve of Cave In. Thank you all so much for being here. It is great to have you guys here today. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you very much for being. Good to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime. And contrary to popular belief, I just want to clear this up now as I've gotten a lot of comments on YouTube about it. Uh, Steve Brodsky and I are, in fact, not related, even though many people speculate. So I just wanted to point that out right now and clear that all up. I mean, he's a handsome guy. You know, I understand the confusion. There, so. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. To be uh, compared to somebody as talented as you is an honor. So I, I take it. But uh, it's so awesome to have you here. Your new album, Heavy Pendulum, is a fantastic album. One of my personal favorites to come out in 2022. Because when you open up with New Reality and you have a track like Waiting for Love and, you know, Days of Nothing, Careless Offering is just a true masterpiece. Being that the previous album, Final Transmission, was obviously written in, you know, a relatively dark and somber time and a project that was born out of grief. Was this album like a completely different emotional state of mind as opposed to Final Transmission? Um, I would say that it was still coming out of grief and Caleb was very much in mind when we wrote the record, but it was also like trying to like put the wheels back on our band and move forward, you know, really trying to move on. But I mean, Caleb was absolutely on our mind, lyric writing and um, his, um, his editing, the way he would have edited the what kind of like his um, quality control, the things he would like and what he wouldn't like. He was very much still within the periphery of our band, but it was also trying to move on with Nate being in the band and Nate having a hand and writing and um, having a say in the way we arrange and lyrics it was definitely a new beginning of like how we're going to do cave and moving forward and i think we i think it also felt good to move on it felt good to like be doing something entirely new and have a almost like almost like a fresh start yeah and you know with final transmission um we completed the record for what it was and then we released it as part of raising money for the Schofield family. And in the process of doing that, we also toured on the record. And that's when we sort of really started to develop a chemistry with Nate. And I think with Heavy Pendulum, we were able to apply all those miles on the road together and those hours spent together to doing something fresh and new. And for Nate, I think that was exciting in the sense that um, you know, as somebody who's been a friend of ours for a long time, he was able to come in and do something creative with a band that he's watched from the sidelines, you know, and he was able to kind of say, all right, here's what I want to hear from Caven and sort of guide the process in that way, uh, much like Caleb sort of exerted a, a, a degree of quality control that was like very beneficial for us as songwriters you know um and uh yeah so having all of that sort of uh running full force during lockdown you know 2020 into 2021 where none of us had really much going on on you know in the calendar no touring no other bands active we could really focus our efforts on Caven, and uh, it was a very different experience and, and a healthy one for the band. And you know what? It was also a huge inspiration as well. Like, um, you know, we, all of your fans, including myself, uh, thank you for pushing forward and really representing on how you all overcome so much. And I actually wanted to mention with Nate coming on board, because Steve, I know you also played in Converge as well as Nate did. So maybe in terms of either chemistry or maybe songwriting on a technique level, did maybe like you two have like a mutual understanding on how you play in a way and like understanding that sort of songwriting process and bringing something together into cave -in? For sure. I mean, we have that shared experience of playing in Converge. And then, you know, after Caleb passed, um, I joined Old Man Gloom. And so, yeah, I think all of those things um, sort of played a role in sort of feeling each other out for like how to move forward. Um, just, you know, going from zero bands together to like, three including you know converge blood moon so you're like a post hardcore mike pat and i just wanted to point that out <laughs> how many bands you've been in um in terms of uh like the 
because you know when you like look at you know until your heart stops to now there is a chronic evolution that i think is prevalent with cave you could tell what will be off of until your heart stops what will be off of antenna what will be off of vinyl transmission etc does every album maybe start off with a preconceived vision of what you want it to sound like or being that your music is on a more experimental side the songwriting process is more or less like throwing paint at the wall seeing what sticks I mean, I think it's just a matter of where the band was at at that certain time. I mean, until your heart stops, you were kids coming out of the suburbs, trying to be like our favorite band, Converge, trying to like get ourselves to a point where we can play with Converge, just simple goals like that, trying to get our the wheels rolling of touring for the first time, going to see the U.S. for the first time. Um, Jupiter was kind of like, again, of where the band was at at that certain time. We were a four-piece all of a sudden. Caleb Schofield was really... A, a, a solid member we had our solid lineup that we would move forward with and that was like trying to figure out where we wanted to fit in as a four piece kind of like going forward with our sound um you know tides of tomorrow and to antenna again what was going on with the band we signed to a major label there was a whole circus around the band about of, of uh, different things going on business wise at that time going to los angeles making a record in like a crazy los angeles studio um, you know, it's all a matter of what the band's going through at certain times. And then Perfect Pitch Black was kind of a response to the major label experience. Um, kind of like a little bit of bitterness and also kind of like trying to re refine, uh, find who we were again after feeling like, I mean, I can only speak for myself, being a little lost in the process of what we did during Antenna. I mean, I think that's a good record, but I think we kind of lost ourselves in like who we were. Uh, um, I read about that actually, because this year is 20 years of Antenna. Um, and, um, it, you know, it's funny because I do I think song, some songs like Woodwork or Sea Frost or Anchor are actually like cave in classics in a way, like an underrated classic. I know, you know, it's maybe be a sort of departure from the relatively post hardcore sound that you start off of. But like, I think it goes to show that, like, um, you are able to push the envelope and step outside your comfort zones. Has there ever been a time because I also thought that really in the realm of post hardcore, your lyrics are also and meanings are also very thought provoking. Could has Caven ever approached things from a conceptual standpoint where maybe like a lyrical idea could help maybe guide the direction uh, of the music? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and speaking of visuals, for the first time I think ever with Heavy Pendulum we had the album cover picked out before having written a piece of music together that ultimately ended up on the new record. And so that was actually a cool way to work, was having this awesome, stunning piece of, you know, spacey, apocalyptic, psychedelic imagery from Ricky, Richie Beckett and, uh, and just saying, well, <laughs> wow, look at this. Let's let's write some music that sounds like this, that makes us feel like what we're looking at. Um, and lyrically, I, I'm constantly making notes of whatever, you know, thoughts pop in my head that might translate well in a musical scenario. Like I, in my phone, I have this page in my notes, it's called Scraps. and. You know, that's what it's for. It's just for, you know, barfing out whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know, little bits in my brain think like, oh, this might have potential somewhere. Um, so in writing music, it's very common to just throw sounds at the wall when I'm trying to figure out vocals for something. And uh, before I get too anchored on a certain sound or a thing, I try to go through like that that page in my phone scraps and see if anything jumps out that might be the seed of something to say something bigger to lyrically grow into some sort of image or a story or a combination of those things um yeah do both of you kind of need to be in the head same like feeling uh the same emotion or be in the same emotional headspace when writing music together or being that you know you've all had your different experiences and you've all played in many different bands and different projects that maybe being in different frames of mind actually helps add contrast to the music yeah i think we all play off each other i think we all have different influences and we kind of inspire each other with whatever we're listening to or whatever we're bringing to the table at that particular time but I mean, we're all very different, but also, like I said, we, everyone could, I'm into this record right now and Steve's into this record and we kind of inspire each other like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I could see where you're coming from. I think it, I think it plays off each other, like you said, it brings contrast to the band. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think it also has something to do with maybe the origin and maybe the scene you're from. Like, every time I ask, like, a metal band, like, you know, what their influences are, you know, they'll say Black Sabbath, Metallica, Maiden, Priest, whatever. Nothing wrong with that. But it almost seems like within, um, you know, the sort of post-hardcore movement with bands like Converge and you guys and, you know, bands like Poison the Well, it almost seems like you all were taking inspiration from each other in a way. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I mean, Converge has always been an inspiration, just because they're local. You know, Converge going on in our area when we were younger. That it, it was crazy to us that that sound was coming out and it was local. So it's always been very inspirational. But I also think we brought in, you know, I think Steve articulated well on an, another interview we did where he said we were taking outside influences like the alternative rock that we grew up on, which we were the perfect age for Nirvana, Smashing Pumpkins, Alice in Chains. Um, you know, Metallica mixing those things, but with underground sounds of like bands like Rorschach. Um, trying to think uh, bands like Into Another you know the, all these underground bands kind of mixing these underground bands with also like I don't know if you want to call it corporate rock or mainstream rock that we were into at that time um, kind of mixing it with like our the, the weird 90s underground world that we kind of came from you know yeah I've always said I could see Kevin you know you're playing with Yab tonight um, and but you know I could almost see you do a tour with you know, I might get crap for this on the tube, but uh, I can almost see you guys even tour with like a more mainstream band, like a Three Days Grace or a Breaking Benjamin or even like a Disturbed or something like that, you know? Sky's the limit. I mean, we toured with Foo Fighters once. We did a tour with Muse. I mean, these are, it was, you know, we played with all sort of different types of band. We did some shows with Raina Maria once. So we played all, all, sort, all over the map. Um, and you know what's cool is Caven's also played not with a variety of different bands, but venues as well. I, you know, you've played at St. Vitus. You know, you've played at, you know, you're playing at Lapus and Rouge tonight. I think there's going to be just as many people on the stage as off the stage in a way. But, you know, playing, you know, at big arenas with artists like Foo Fighters or Muse and stuff, is that almost a different type of Caven experience depending on like the atmosphere that you're present in? It can be for sure. Um, I think the bands that we play with sometimes dictate that as well um or our placement on the bill um but regardless we just try to be well rehearsed and we try to pick our songs um in a way that we're stoked to be doing what we're doing and um that really doesn't change no matter where we play you know um so it's good. It's good to just have this sort of core set standard for what we want to see, like as far as me pretending to be in the, the crowd for a cave and show, like what do I want to see? What kind of energy? What kind of vibe? And just trying to remember that for every step forward that we take, you know, in a, in a live situation. Do you almost have to practice crowd interaction or stage presence, especially with bands that has started in like a post hardcore sort of movement? I feel like crowd interaction and stage presence is just as important as the music in a way. So is that almost something you practice or perfect over time in a way? Can you prepare for that or do you just have to let that come naturally? Um, I think it comes with experience and just the miles, you know, I mean, in crowd interaction, I mean, I'm not very good at it because I don't talk in the mic too much. But I mean, I could watch Steve and Nate do it. They've just gotten better at it over the years. Um, and as far as performing, I mean, we've been playing shows since we were 15 years old. So it's just miles, you know, repetition, getting more comfortable. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of going to shows and just seeing how bands present themselves. And, you know, there could be an artist that does something that you're not into. And that's just as useful for how I want to present myself as seeing an artist that is saying things or doing things that, you know, I'd like to take a piece from and emulate in my own version or on my own world. Um, you know, like uh, one thing that comes to mind is like, you know, performers of the 70s and the 80s, you know, like these old school punks that like cut their teeth way before the internet, way before like even we touched an instrument and it is like this different type of swagger, this different type of movement different type of eye contact with the crowd. Um, I mean, seeing negative approach was like mind blowing in that way. Um, seeing the damned where, um, you know, there's artists who don't necessarily want photos and videos taken at their shows, but the damned are like, we don't care. Take as many photos as you want. Take video, throw it on the internet, make us famous. Yeah. And I loved that, you know? Yeah, I would love to have seen them open up for Tool right before that or something like that. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, yeah talk about contrasting uh, in performances mm -hmm. in a way. Um, 
when it comes to like uh, the music too, this is kind of like a very deep question I like to ask artists because I've always said that art is life and it can grow, it can develop. Sometimes it could eventually, you know, even like die in that regards and sort of like its significance. But like, do you want everything that you create? This could be for any project you've been involved with, but do you want your music to be a snapshot of who you are at that particular time? Or do you think that maybe the art can grow with you as you evolve over time? Because I do think like, some songs off of like antenna have aged like fine wine and stuff like that. Um, you, I mean, I think there certainly are a snapshot of who we are at that time, but I mean, uh, I think they take on new life and new meaning as time goes on. I mean, especially after Caleb passed songs, songs hit differently without a doubt, you know? So I think over time, whatever your life experiences you go through, the meaning changes, you know, and, uh, it could almost have a whole new life. So. Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say? Yeah, I, I, I guess to put maybe a visual spin on that concept, um, you know, I mean, I have hundreds of print photos saved in boxes at home. Um, it doesn't mean I look at them all the time, but um, it's interesting to document how I feel about something that I haven't looked at or listened to or whatever, um, you know, in the present versus six months ago or a year ago or five years ago. And um, with records, it's interesting because physically, I think we're at the point now, or I, I'm especially at the point vocally where I'm noticing changes in my voice and things that I have to do a little bit differently to emulate a feeling or, a, or you know, try to hit the mark of something that I did as a teenager, you know? Like I can't just jump on the mic and scream <laughs> until your heart stops songs like I did when I was 19. You know, I had to kind of figure out a new way of doing it. Um, and I think I did okay with it, but to your point, like just the decrepitude of time and the, the, the way that the body ages, it, it, it makes you have to think differently just about what you do when you go back to those <laughs> younger years and you try to jump back in that skin. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been a really interesting and, and sometimes frustrating challenge for me, but um, you know, Nate's been great as far as like, you know, coaching with how he approaches aggressive vocals. Cause you know, he's got one of the most ferocious and notable voices in that realm in the game, you know? Um, so yeah, uh, I, I don't know if that necessarily answers your question. But oh, you be... answered it like up one side and down the other perfectly. Oh, right on. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. And, uh, I have two more questions for you and this is sort of like a part B of this last question, but you know, all art is also open to interpretation and, you know, you have a very dedicated fan base. I've had the, you know, I've had the privilege of hanging out with many great people who have said they've grown up with your music and stuff. So do you think that maybe other people's interpretation of it or other people's stories or experience with your music can add another layer of meaning as well. Um, absolutely. You know, it, it, and that's like, you know, that's having fans of your band that kind of almost show you new dynamics of your own music. Sometimes I'm like, Oh, I never thought of it that way, but that's really cool. You know? I and mean, it's, I mean, I, I really appreciate that people have been on this journey with us for this long. I mean, we've been a band for like 20 years, over 20 years now. So it's a trip when people a say they grew up with our bands and, you know, tell me how songs mean to them because it honestly, honestly makes me look at it through a new mirror or a new, a new lens, you know? I was nine when Antenna came out, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm pushing 30 this year, wow. so. Just, uh, yeah, what a trip. <laughs> and um, the final question I wanted to have you is being that you are both so prolific artists and, you know, have been so involved in your scenes and whatnot, has also playing with other bands and, you know, being mad scientists, if you will, allowed you to bring in some new stuff to cave in or you all like to leave every project exclusively to that specific project. No, I mean, being doing the other bands has made Caven better. I mean, I, I can just speak for myself. I did a band called Clouds and I did a band called Nomad Stones for years and it helped me develop a voice, helped me develop guitar solos, helped me develop songwriting, helped me develop different dynamics with JR of playing you know, different, almost punk rock, classic rock sort of way that we brought back to Caven. Um, vocals, I brought it back to Caven. The, just the different things you do in different bands, it makes you better on the outside. You bring that whole new dynamic that you've learned about yourself and developed on these other bands back into the cave. And I think it's made the band better, you know? I mean, I wasn't singing on cave and records when we first started. I am now, you know? So. Yeah. And to further that point, like, uh, you know, in the band, it, 
sort of winded down for the first time after the antenna record and touring cycle and everybody kind of went their separate ways for a minute to just explore other avenues realms of music expressions etc um when we regrouped for perfect pitch black that's when things got really interesting and there's a noticeable difference between the writing and the vibe and the the sound and the voice of Caven, um, you know, pre perfect pitch black and then post perfect pitch black. And I think, you know, once that sort of mark was set, the band really started to um, just do cool things that were um, just really special for our evolution like uh the white silence record as one of my top caven records you know and that was really like uh the pinnacle of you know adam and especially caleb like bringing their newfound sense of songwriting and voice and vocals and ideas and leadership to the creative process of the band and, uh, you know, I still go back to that record as one of my favorite cave records. And then, you know, that's also a tradition, you know, creatively that we just try to sort of soldier, soldier on with, you know. And if you listen to Heavy Pendulum, it's, it's no different. You know, you hear everybody's voice and, and, you know, thoughts and wants and desires for creativity and music just coming out and, you know, it also it's reflective of like a a shift in me where I just I couldn't carry that thing anymore that I used to do where I had every single line picked out or I had every note picked out for every part and I knew what the beat was supposed to be and you know uh, that had a time and a place in Caven and I think the band is a lot better off now as a creative unit um, with you know everybody kind of pushing in that direction yeah i love it like i feel like you know you could go down a musical rabbit hole and you know i've discovered i'm sure a lot of people have discovered a lot of great new music just because of cave in and by sheer coincidence it uh happened to be the same i even have a joke saying wow that guy from utoy man looks exactly like that guy from cave in strange <laughs> and i do that with every band I, I i said that when i saw uh cold chamber for the first time i was like he looks like that guy from devil driver so, so, you know, it, it's a going thing so uh, before we go I want to thank you both so much for your time and most importantly thank you for some amazing new music again with Heavy Pendulum is there just anything else with Caven that you'd like to promote uh, you know um, with this after this tour with Yob in terms of what else we could be expecting in terms of shows or any other new music and feel free to plug uh, any project you're both involved with start with you Adam um, as far as Caven, I think we have, uh, there's going to be a Jupiter reissue down the line, um, which I'm stoked about. Relapse did an amazing job on the Until Your Heart Stops reissue. So I think we're just going to start reissuing our records. Um, we have some stuff coming up in Europe in August, and we're doing, um, well, I, maybe this one comes, we're doing some bot shows, which I don't know if that's announced, but I'm announcing it now. We're doing two <laughs> bot shows in November, so which is going to be a trip. And um, that's about it for right now. I think Converge and Mutoy Man will be taking up the schedule going forward for a little while, but I know Caven has another record in us at least, so we'll get back to it. Ending off for you, Steve. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> All right. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. We are here with Caven, Heavy Pendulum. Pick it up. You do not want to miss it. This is Alex from Heavy New York. We will see you next time. Oh,